Good morning, everyone. I am Abby Elizabeth, and this is the Earth and Vessels YouTube channel. This channel is for Christian women, but anyone is welcome to listen. Today, I have a, a message that hopefully will be pretty simple and short, but it's about the concept of loving one's enemies and how do we do that. It's very clear from the scripture that we are commanded to love our enemies. But this isn't always an easy thing to do. So I thought I would speak to that a little bit, especially because many of the women who listen to this channel have experienced great harm in their lives. And it's very hard sometimes to love one's enemies. And I certainly know that and have experienced that myself. So in Matthew, the book of Matthew, chapter 5, and we'll begin with verse 44. But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you, that you, ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven, for he maketh his Son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. For if ye love them which love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans the same? And if ye salute your brethren only, what do ye more than others? Do not even the publicans so? Be ye, therefore, perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Now this seems like a very tall order indeed, but it is possible to understand from the scripture how we can do this. First I want to begin by talking about the word repentance and what it means. Repentance means to turn away from one thing and turn towards another. It's not just expressing regret, which is the modern day definition of repent. So many people these days who are professing Christians are mistaken in that they think what repentance means is to tell God and other people that they're sorry all the time. And it's not about that at all. What repentance means in the Bible is to turn from sin and turn towards Jesus Christ, to change one's life, to change what one does. It's an action, not a feeling and not a statement. Now, now, why do I bring this up in the context of loving one's enemies? Well, first of all, as Christians, we have to recognize the magnitude of what was done for us, that Jesus Christ the only begotten Son of God, shed his innocent blood at the cross, was tortured to death, and died when he was innocent and perfect and full of love. He laid down his life for human sin. And those of us who have obeyed the gospel by, by repenting of our sin, being baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of our sins and receiving the Holy Ghost, as written of in Acts chapter 2, verses 38 and 39. Those of us who have obeyed that, we have had our sins remitted. And that means that really, through a very simple act of obedience, we have had the weight of our sin and its penalty taken from us so that we now have the ability to approach Almighty God, having been rec reconciled to Him. So this is something that is achieved pretty simply. It's not terribly difficult to do. One doesn't need to attend a seminary. One, one doesn't need to spend years and years doing penitence and acts of penitence and, and saying lists of prayers or, or um, anything like that. All one needs to do to be saved is to obey 
the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it's fairly simple to do. So we were cleaned of our sins and its penalty, our sins penalty, by the grace and mercy of God. And this was provided to us because of the love of God. And we were the enemies of God until we did this. And yet, while we were his enemies, while we were serving the world and serving our own flesh and, and serving the enemies of God, maybe without knowing it, but we were still doing so, his son died for us. And there is not one of us who was deserving of that. So that is the perfect love of our Heavenly Father. If we are to be ambassadors for Christ, then we are commanded by Jesus Christ, the Son of God, to have love in us that's akin to that. Because the world, the world loves their own. They love those who agree with them. They love those who give them what they want who tell them what they want to hear. It's, it's not difficult to do that. But it is difficult to, to love one's enemies, particularly if they have done you extreme harm, particular harm to you. And this issue comes up a lot that people come to me and say, well, how, how does one forgive these things? Well, it is possible to do. Let's turn now to the book of Titus, chapter 3. Titus, chapter 3. And we'll begin We'll begin with verse 2. It says, To speak evil of no, no man, to be no brawlers, but gentle, showing all meekness, unto all men, for we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But after that, the kindness and love of our God, of God our Savior, toward man appeared, not by the works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior. So this, the washing of regeneration, of course, is referring to to being baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of our sins. And the renewing of the Holy Ghost is when we receive the Holy Spirit and the, the, the power of God living in us so that we can live in holiness. But this isn't a work of righteousness that we have done. We simply obeyed the gospel, which is simple to do. It's not a work of the flesh. It's an act of obedience. Now, when we consider what we once were, foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another, that these things are, are traits of every sinner. So the thing is, you know, there's no such thing as righteous indignation in a sinner. So a sinner perceives some harm has been done to them, and rightfully so. A harm was done to them. So we're not denying that evil was committed. But the sinner responds to that by hating the person who perpetrated the harm against them instead of hating the evil and the poison that every human being has partaken of. And this isn't our fault. We were born into it. 
And yet it is our fault because we partake of it. There's only one way to be free of that evil, and that is to obey the, the gospel of Jesus Christ, to, to repent, to turn away from our own ways and turn towards Jesus Christ and obey the gospel. This is how we begin to see things the way God sees them and not the way we see them through the lens of our own sin. What I would say to all people who listen to this channel is that if you're having trouble forgiving your enemies and the people who harmed you, it's very likely because you have not obeyed the gospel and you are still looking at the world through the lens of your own sin. So, so when we are in a condition of heart where we feel like a victim or we feel some anger about things that have happened or if we even feel as if we have been given kind of a raw deal in life by, by some of the hardships and, and sins that, that were inflicted upon us, that all of these things are conditions of unforgiveness. When one has not been forgiven themselves, had the blood of Jesus Christ applied to their lives, very likely any efforts that they make to forgive their enemies are going to be very short-lived and not very, not, not really very true. Because there's only one way that we can be perfect in Jesus Christ, and that is to obey the gospel. When Jesus commanded us to be perfect, even as our Heavenly Father is perfect, by loving our enemies, this is impossible for a person who is yet in bondage to sin and death because they have not experienced the love of God and the mercy of God. It's there for them to experience, but they haven't experienced it. And when we ourselves have not found forgiveness, it's very hard for us to forgive others. I would venture to say that it's impossible. But when a person obeys the gospel and their sins are remitted, not only will they be able to see sinners the way God does, but they will then be able to walk in love. Now, let's turn now to the book of 1 John, chapter 4 and verse 18. So 1 John, chapter 4 and verse 18. And the reason I'm going to this scripture is to talk about fear, because another stronghold in, in new Christians' lives is that of fear. Because the enemy comes in and tries to tell you that you're not worthy in some way or the other, either by reminding you about your past or by pointing out the various ways that you're still trying to become Christ-like. So in 1 John chapter 4 and verse 18, we read, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. Well, let's talk about perfect love for a moment. Let's turn to Matthew 22, chapter 22 verses 37 through 40, Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So this is of course, the, the fundamental commandment that was given to us by God to obey and then spoken to us by his Son, Jesus Christ, which is to love the Lord our God with all our heart, our mind, our soul, and our strength, and to love our neighbor as ourself. So let's turn now to the book of Romans, 
chapter 2. And let's begin in verse 3. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such things, and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? You know, that that's what leads us to repentance. I know for me, I, when I repented, it was because I saw what Jesus had done for me. I think I saw a video where someone was um, representing the cross of Jesus Christ and, and what happened there. And when I saw that, it, it brought me to my knees and to tears before God because I saw that that Jesus Christ was was innocent and full of love and laid down his life for me, a sinner. And that goodness of God led me to repentance, but it also led me to love my God and my Savior. Because this was something I couldn't pull myself up, up out of any more than someone who's in quicksand can get themselves out of it. Unless somebody comes along and pulls that person out of the quicksand, they will be dead very shortly. They will go down into the pit. And that is the condition of every single sinner. Without Jesus Christ, without obeying him, one goes into the pit. But when one sees what he did for us and what he provided to us, a gift of mercy and of love, that, that then we love him. So to love the Lord our God with all our heart and all our mind and soul, all our strength is the, the first and, and the greatest commandment. But the one like unto it is the one that most people have trouble with. And the reason why, again, they have trouble with it usually is because they have not yet obeyed the gospel. They're dwelling in their own unforgiveness. To simply hear the word of God is not going to save you. And we can read of this in Romans chapter 2 and verse 13. For not hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. So it's when we obey the commandments of Jesus Christ. And there, this is written of also in the book of First John, and let's just turn there quickly in First John chapter 2 and verse 4. It says, He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoso keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby we know that we are in him. In order to have love perfected in us, we have to obey the commandments of Jesus Christ. And the first commandment is that we obey the gospel. That was the first thing that the disciples preached after they received the Holy Ghost at Pentecost. And this is the way of salvation. So the first thing that we must do to demonstrate our obedience and our love for Jesus Christ is to obey that, to obey the gospel. And when that happens, when our sins are remitted, then we can look at the sins of others differently. Because then we just want them to have what we have. And we don't see their sin as being any worse than our sin. We want them to find the truth. Does this mean that we agree with sinners? That we tell them that they're all set, they're going to heaven, no matter what they do? Well, of course not, because that wasn't true for us. We tell them that their sin will, the weight of their sin will pull them to hell unless they repent and turn to Jesus Christ. And we do this not because we want to upset them. And it often does upset them. 
but we tell them because we love them. And we do so with as much humility and softness as possible, but we do not withhold from them the truth. Because if we do, how is that loving? To tell someone that, that they're okay with God, or to let them believe that they're okay with God, when they haven't obeyed the gospel, is not loving. It, it's codependent. It's enabling. It's enabling of evil. Now, I know that it's difficult to recognize the difference between divine love and human love. Human love wants something in return. So when we're in our flesh, when we love someone, we love them so that they'll love us back. Divine love isn't like that. Divine love tells people the truth so that they can be redeemed. That's what Jesus did, and they killed him for it. That's the difference between divine love and fallen human fleshly love. Now, the third thing that I want to discuss, we talked about fear. We talked about forgiveness or unforgiveness. Now let's talk about unbelief. Because many people have a stronghold in their lives of of affliction, some kind of physical or mental disorder where they're having trouble receiving healing. And this is because of unbelief or a weak faith. So let's turn to the book of Proverbs, chapter 20 and verse 17. Proverbs, chapter 20 and verse 17. That's not right. Hold on. Proverbs chapter 20 and verse 12. It's the glasses. Okay, the hearing ear and the seeing eye. The Lord hath made even both of them. Our faith comes from God. The enemy likes to come in and say, Oh, see, you're not being healed. It means your faith is weak and leave you there. But that's that's not certainly not the purpose of this video. Is to, to when I say that that when we are not receiving a healing, it's because of unbelief. That's not to accuse, but to point you to the answer. So the answer is to recognize that God was the one who gave us ears to hear and eyes to see in the beginning. He's the one who gave us our faith and the ability to believe his word and to obey his commandments. That was a gift from God in itself. That's what the scripture says. The hearing ear and the seeing eye the Lord hath made even both of them. Therefore, if we have weak faith, what we need to do is go to him and ask him for more, to ask him to help our unbelief and to increase our faith. Let's go to the book of Mark, chapter 9 and verse 24. And this, well, actually it's start in verse 23, but this is when Jesus Christ, the Son of God, healed a, a boy who had a demon in him, and a devil. And this devil was tormenting him greatly, casting him into the fire, and the child could not even speak. This child had been brought to Jesus Christ by his father, and he asked him to have compassion on them and help them. Jesus said unto him in verse 23, if thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. And straightway the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help thou my unbelief. So this is what we must do when we have an affliction that is not being removed from us right away. And this is also the case with any kind of stronghold of fear or of unforgiveness. You know, if we want to be able to forgive the unforgivable, that is not going to come from our own strength. It's only going to come by obedience and by calling on the name of Jesus to help us. When we have had crimes 
perpetrated upon us when we were young or when we were certainly trying to do our very best as wives or as sisters, as children, as daughters, that it's very hard for the flesh to forgive those harms done. But the way we do so is to ask Jesus Christ, the source of our faith, the source of of our salvation, to do the work in us. So all of these strongholds can be torn down by the prayer of faith, calling on the name of the Lord Jesus. Let's turn now to the book of Philippians. And these things are just not things that we can do ourselves. But I do know from experience that what seemed impossible to me was done in me by Jesus, not by me, but by Jesus. So let's read in the book of Philippians chapter 1. And of course, when we read this passage, we do know that this was written to the saints at Philippi, and it was not written to the world at large or, or to, to every person who lived in the, the city of Philippi. All right? So we begin in verse 1. Paul and Timotheus, the servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi, with the bishops and deacons. So this is something that's written to the church and not to the world at large. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making a request with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. The, the fellowship in the gospel is the fellowship that those who have obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ is contained in Acts chapter 2, verses 38 and 39, that those who have obeyed that gospel now have fellowship. Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. So the one that does the work in us is Jesus Christ. And the only way for that work to take place is for us to follow the commandment to love. First, to lo love the Lord our God with all our heart, our mind, our soul, and our strength, knowing that anything that we are was provided to him. And the hearing ear, the seeing eye, and even the ability to, to obey the word, to obey the gospel, was a gift from God. So when we love God, we know that we didn't save ourselves, that he saved us. That's the first thing. So the commandment to love, to love God, is first, and then to love our neighbor as ourself, because having had our sins remitted, we no longer hold anything against anyone who did anything to us because we know that the whole world is groaning in sin and everyone is harmed by it even the people who harmed us they are harmed by it too and when we are saved in Jesus Christ we only want for anyone for for them to have what we have to have their sins remitted and to be renewed by the holy ghost in order to be to be saved into the kingdom of God. So this is Christian love. This is how we are made perfect in love. And then we're not afraid anymore. And when the enemy tries to tell us that we're not worthy, we say, well, yeah, you're right. No one is worthy. But Jesus Christ is worthy. And he died for me, and I have obeyed his gospel. So now, now, Satan, if you have a problem with me, don't take it up with me. Take it up with him, because he's my Savior, and I believe. I have faith. This is how we call on the name of Jesus Christ when we are attacked 
by the enemy. There will be many religious people who will point at you and say, Who are you? Who are you to speak of holiness? Who are you to speak of God? What manner of woman is this? Let's turn now to the book of First Corinthians, chapter 1, and we will begin with verse 25. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty and the base things and base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus. So anything that we are is because of Jesus. Who of God has made us unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. So it would be very um, much an evil thing for someone whose sins are remitted to hold on to any harm that anyone ever did to them. It would be a grievous sin because it was the goodness of God that brought us to redemption. And now that we are saved, we should be full of that love, the love of Jesus Christ, the, the man who was born into the world to save sinners, who laid down his perfect human life at the cross so that we might live, that nothing, anyone, could have ever done to us would be worth turning away from that. When we love Jesus and when we obey Jesus, then we become like Jesus. We have him in us. And then we want for the world what was given to us. And we let go of any ideas we have about judging others in the way where we're condemning them. Now that doesn't mean that we don't don't discern sin, because we certainly do discern sin. But we discern sin in order to speak the truth and love to people, not to condemn people. It is the sin that is our enemy, not the sinner. And a Christian speaks the truth in love about how a sinner is saved. So the modern day practice in the church is to, to agree with sin and to tell people that they're all set with God when they're continuing in sin is actually not love at all. It's simply enabling evil. And a true Christian will do their very best to speak the truth in love. I hope this message has been a blessing to you. It's certainly been a blessing to me. And feel free to email me if you have other questions or make a comment in the comment section below because I'm here for you. This is what I do. And it's my heart's desire to see as many people as possible attain the kingdom of God through his righteousness, through the righteousness of Jesus Christ and not anything that we have made in ourselves. The work of righteousness in a Christian is done through Jesus Christ and not by our own will. And as long as we're trying to do it ourselves, we, we stumble around, around quite a bit. The answer is not to try really hard to be a good Christian, because that's self-righteousness and hypocrisy. Rather, the answer is to try really hard 
to love Jesus Christ and to do what he said. And, and to do it knowing that the power to be righteous comes only from him. And to be thankful for that every day regarding the divine love that sent his only begotten son to die for us. I hope this message is clear and you all remain in my prayers.